Let's open our Bibles to the book of Jude. We can't go to a chapter, there's only one. So we go to the book of Jude tonight. Uh, we had a fellow named Jude that is ready to be baptized, but he's sick. And uh, he was supposed to be baptized last week, and his family got sick, and then he was supposed to be baptized this week, and uh, he's still, they're still dealing with it. Uh, but we're going to preach on Jude tonight, not the young man, <laughs> but the book. Now, I hope y'all can get animated some, to some extent tonight. <laughs> I am telling you what, I feel like uh, I, I'm, I'm at a brick wall, literally. I'm, I, I might as well just turn around and preach this way, you know. I, I feel like I get more life out of that glass, you know. So I hope this is the week they put our sign up. This is the first week of August. And uh, so uh, maybe this will be the week. I, I'm, I'm a skeptic when anybody tells you they're going to do something like that uh, because uh, you just don't expect everybody to say, do what they say. But, uh, but I'm hoping, and uh, we, uh, I, I told the people here on Wednesday night, we, we went up with the Utes uh, to uh, Stone Mountain the other day and, the, and uh, of course, had a blowout. On the bus, of course, you got to have a blowout every time you go. And uh, anyway, that was on Monday and then Tuesday. And then, uh, uh, of course, Wednesday, we just, it's, we've had homeless problems here again this week. Uh, folks tearing up things, camping out back, trashing the place, and uh, always doing some kind of damage to our equipment out there. And so, that my wife's been under the weather quite a bit this week. My daughter's got COVID. My daughter's baby's got COVID. Uh, you know, <laughs> Lamar gets sick, and he's in the. It's just been a wild week, you know. Something. Uh, you say, well, what does it affect you? Well, it, it all it all does. Uh, you know, you just it's your loved ones, your uh, folks you care about, and you see them go through all that, and uh, it just uh, it's just not a been a, a good time. But hey, we got the Bible. And uh, we're going to talk to you tonight about uh, having to contend for the faith. I mean, we need to uh, be ready to fight for the faith uh, tonight. We're, we're in a world that there's an attack every week on Christianity. Hey, we've read about the overseas attacks where people have gone in and killed folks in the congregation. Uh, but now, uh, right here in America, there's an onslaught against Christianity. There's legislation coming out trying to uh, keep us from practicing our God-given Bible faith. Uh, it was uh, the uh, senator in uh, Massachusetts uh, two weeks ago came out and said she's going to try to pass a bill uh, to outlaw all the pregnancy crisis centers. And uh, the idea, of course, is these places are set up to help ladies who uh, want to make a choice, a, a true choice, freedom of choice, not uh, to, to have the baby. Uh, nobody gives them a choice to have the baby now. You go to these places and they want to tell you to abort the babies. And so uh, Elizabeth Warren came out the other day and said, we're going to pass some laws to make it illegal to have these sinners. And she had the call to say, you know, there's three of these sinners to every one abortion clinic. Well, you mean, you ought to be happy about saving lives. But she's, she's just an angry woman that wants to promote this, uh, the consequences. Uh, and let's be absolutely honest. Uh, these pregnancies uh, are, are not, the, the vast majority, of, and I'm talking about probably 85, 90%, have nothing to do with rape or incest. They simply have to do with people uh, taking their so-called sexual freedom and using it many times irresponsibly and immorally in many cases. And so the way they fix that is they just uh, say, well, we'll just uh, have an abortion and go on about our business and carry on our lives. And so what these places like we've supported here over the years, Safe Harbor, uh, they're out there to say if a lady just chooses and rightfully so chooses to keep her baby, we, these crisis centers provide support, counseling, medical support, 
and even help with the adoption if they choose to put the baby up for adoption. And if not, they help support the, the mother, even though she might be considered a single mother, they, they're there for them. And we have financially supported them here and other places around the country, but specifically here with Safe Harbor. And they do a great work down there. Why would you want to shut that down? Well, what is the rationale uh, to shut that down? It, it makes no sense whatsoever uh, to say that that's wrong for them to have that type of thing. It's, it shows you that right has been turned into wrong and wrong has been turned into right. And that's the curse of God on the culture as found in the book of Isaiah. He said, because you've turned from me, uh, they're going to say right is wrong and wrong is right. And that not only... Uh, is uh, for that uh, event and that uh, uh, philosophy that, that causes those to have the killing of the unborn. But it's in everything. Uh, folks just don't want to contend for the faith anymore. And, because, and we have to. Or we're going we're gonna to fall by the wayside like in England. Uh, you go over there tonight, there's very few. There's just a scattering of churches. we got missionaries going to England to start churches. Or try to start a church. <laughs> That, that tells you where we're at. And uh, uh, England's not sending out any missionaries anymore. They did early on in this country's history. I mean, you had your Wesleys and your Whitfields. They came over here, but they don't have anything like that anymore. And we're getting where we're not doing it. And certainly just a few Bible churches around the country are sticking together and sending folks to places where the gospel's not so available and uh, so, so when, when we don't stand up for what we have, uh, you're going to find out there's going to be a great failure across the board. Maybe our kids or grandkids won't have churches to go to, you know? Can you imagine that? Just no churches. And uh, the ones that come uh, are, are, are not attended. It's, uh, and in this passage that we're looking at tonight directly relates to that. That's You can take 2022 and directly relate it to what we're about to read. And that is that this problem is not new in the local churches. Jude was dealing with this way back before the Apostle Paul died and the Apostle John. And even then, early on in the first 30 years of Christianity, there was already a movement to undo what the Holy Spirit had done. And uh, that's what this whole book's about. It's warning the saints of God to be alert and be aware because there is a movement, an organized satanic movement going on to infiltrate the movement of the church and to derail it. And we find that in the page, this, the first page or two of this one chapter book. So he could have wrote this letter in 2022 just as good as he did way back in the day that he wrote it. Now, uh, one of the things that we know, look at verse number 19 of Jude 1. It says, these, speaking of these false teachers, uh, they, these being they who separate themselves sensual, not having, having not the spirit. So when he talks about teachers getting in the church, the real church, false teachers, uh, he says to us, they're there, they got there, but they're not saved. Now here's how I do it, you do it. We watch TV and we see some of these uh, false teachers and they seem nice. They look good. Uh, they are very successful in worldly means, very successful. In fact, some of your most uh, financially successful people, whether it be secular or Christian, are some of these teachers. And we go, uh, you know, they seem nice. They every now and then say something about Jesus. And uh, surely they couldn't be lost. Well, Jude warns the saints of God that People just like that are going to infiltrate the church. And they're going to actually try to parade as Christians and even profess to know Jesus Christ. When in reality they're absolute liars and deceivers. 
and they use their position as they come in to set up shop and eventually they sway listeners and those who look on outward means. They, uh, you know, look, today uh, you, know, you take the, you just say, let's, let's compare, let's go up to the hills of East Tennessee. Uh, some of those small backwoods towns. And you get a fellow who never really even graduated from high school, but for the most part, uh, these preachers up in that area have been preaching for 350 to 400 years uh, without necessarily having an academic education. But God has used them. And we look sometimes on TV, will portray these kind of people as backwoods hillbillies with no sense. So consequently, they can't be telling the truth. And then they'll put a flashy guy up there who's got a, uh, you know, a Mercedes. Uh, he's got a really nice house, an a eight, ten bedroom house. He dresses in high dollar clothes. And he has, seems to have a massive social media fo uh, following. And the general American mind goes, he must be the one right with God. And the backwood hill, Millie, he's just a loser. When in reality... The backwood hillbilly more represents the way God used men down through the history of this country than the highly successful, affluent, materialistic dude who's portraying and pretending in order that he might gain from the people of God. And so that's what this whole book's about. And so he gives us some ideas when he says in chapter number 1 in verse 1, he says, Jude the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, and then he says, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. And so we're going to be charged to contend for the faith because we have certain resources we're operating on. People say, well, how can I? I don't know enough about this and Bible. I don't have a theology degree. I can't contend for the faith. Uh, not so. Every believer's called of God, which enables him to be a contender for the faith. You see, when you get saved, God teaches you that which he does not teach the unsaved. That's why when you try to debate some heathen professor uh, and he may cast light and makes fun of all the doctrines that you tell, try to teach him about, and he makes fun of the Bible. You say, well, how can he do that? Because he's ignorant of spiritual truth. God has blinded his eyes. In order, he, he doesn't allow him to even see what we would consider natural sight. He can't look at this country. You know, we see this country and see how it's turned against God. We've seen it. See how they've kicked God out of the public arena or tried to. See how they've tried to blame everything on climate change as though man created it. And not, this is not the judgment of God, they say. This is something that man did with aerosol, aerosol spray cans. And, uh, and so it gets so sickening that they, they refuse to acknowledge God. They profess themselves to be wise, but they came, became fools. And so we can see that, but you take a loss academic professor and he thinks that's funny he can't even envision it he said that's a simplification oh no no it's spiritual insight that God gives his people because we know what the book says and God reveals the book in our heart and allows us to apply it you see wisdom is that knowledge being able to apply and so right here, Jude says, you, you ought to contend because, number one, you've been called of God. Now, you little boys out in the neighborhood playing with his friends, uh, for him to come home, his mother has to go out the door and call his name, call him out. He won't come until he's called. And thank God... Uh, the Bible says uh, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Hey, Jesus said, Come unto me, uh, all who labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Listen, if you are saved today, you've had the Holy Spirit convict you 
and His voice has called you. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And so we are, if you're saved, you're called. And uh, because of that, that's a resource that enables you the privilege and the ability to do some contending for the faith. And we ought to be thankful tonight for that. And then look at the compassion of God. The compassion of God found in verse number 3. Beloved is what we're called. That's God's word through the Holy Spirit, uh, through Jude. And, he, and, you know, not all of us are beloved people, but God looks at us as His beloved. In fact, we know the verse that says, Here in His love, not that we love God, that he, but that God first loved us. So we are His beloved. And because we're called and beloved of Him, that puts us in the army that enables us to fight the fight. And like I say, you, you may not have all the answers uh, to all the questions. There's this great fear when people face lost people because lost people have a way of bringing up arguments that have been brought up for centuries. But many times when we engage them, we may have not heard some of these arguments. Every now and then I'll run into somebody, they'll bring something up that I know that was brought up in the late uh, 1700s and early 1800s by the Bible rejectors. And they'll, find, they'll say, there's contradictions in the Bible. And they'll bring up a passage here and a passage there. Now, they haven't studied the Bible, but they've studied where they think are perceived errors. And that's all they know. You and I study the Bible with no thought about looking for perceived errors. We believe it's the Word of God. We believe every word of it's true. We believe, we get, believe God's preserved it in this English copy. He's given us His holy word. And as I look at it, I don't read it critically trying to find an error because I know whether I can understand it or not, there are no errors in this book. I may think I see one, but it's my problem and not this book's problem. And the longer you read and study it, you'll find these so-called errors, and they've got a list of them. It's amazing. They've got a list of 10 or 12. They say, well, you see, it says that uh, Joshua did this here, and, and this guy says that he did it. Nehemiah said he did it. No, 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 no. You keep reading it. You keep reading it. In many cases, where one said they did it, the next prophet was talking about it being done. Not that he did it. Folks don't read the fine print in the Bible. They get a concept and they say, you see, the Bible contradicts it. Listen, I have not, and, and I'm looking when people point them out. I've looked at everyone everybody's ever pointed out to me, and I do not see one contradiction in this Bible. What I see is folks read the Bible with a bias, and they can't accept exactly what it says. And when they can't accept exactly what it says, then they start biasing that there's errors in it. And then they, then they don't like it when you show them that they missed a word here or there. Or they interpose their bias on the book. And when you take that bias off, you can see what God said God said. And there are no errors. And so we've got to contend for this book. But you can't memorize all that stuff. And God didn't expect you and I to be able to chase out every error. And you know, there are some minds that can do that. I'm not interested in it, really, literally. When people start bringing that up, I'm not interested in it. I know my soul uh, has been confirmed by God that this book is without error. That's just the way it is. I'll go to my grave saying this book is without error because I believe it to be without error, without any doubt. And so folks who want to deal and choke on it and kick, fall over all this stuff, listen, poor things is all I got to say. Life's a lo whole lot better to live when you know who God is and know who, what his book says. It just makes it a whole lot better. Well, he said, you're, you've got the compassion of God. You've got the calling of God. Look at verse 1. He says at the bottom, and preserved in Jesus Christ. You've got the care of God. In fact, uh, God likens his care to a military guard, a bodyguard. 
That's what the meaning of preserved is. And in its context, it tells us it's like God places guards by us throughout our whole journey of our Christian life. Now, we uh, have heard about uh, your, your angel. Uh, I don't know if we got personal angels or not. I know that God watches over us. God takes care of us. God enables us. God leads us. God guides us. God confirms us. I, I don't know if we have to have a personal angel by us to do that. I just know that God has allowed angels to minister to his people through a variety of means. Maybe it won't be in human form. Maybe it would be and we didn't know it. Who knows? But we know this. The Bible tells us that we're preserved in Jesus Christ. We're cared for, watched over, and kept safe by his guard. We know the Holy Spirit is the way that he has sealed us under the day of redemption. And so we're given calling, we're given compassion, we're given care, uh, and then look at the riches that we're given. In fact, in verse number two, it says you got mercy, you got peace, and you got love. How can I contend for the faith? I've been loaded up. <laughs> I've been given gifts in order to enable me to do it. Mercy, God does not give me that which I deserve. Peace is a calm soul in the midst of a storm, the ability to have confidence and rest in the midst of trial. And then, of course, love, an unconditional, unstoppable love of God. Who shall separate us from the love of God, Paul says. And then he lists all the scenarios that people said, well, that means God doesn't love you. The tribulation means that. Uh, perils, but no. He says, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. And so those are our riches. We've got our resources to contend for the faith. And now we've got ideas that God is taking care of. So we've got the calling of God, the compassion of God, the care of God, and the gifts of God. And then notice our responsibility in verse number 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, there is not fragmented salvation. It's not that some people believe you're saved this way and other people believe you're saved this way and it really doesn't matter. No, there is a absolute common salvation. That's salvation by grace through faith. And there is no other salvation in any other name under the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's common. You can't be saved by going to Salt Lake City and doing your thing. You can't be saved by going through the steps of the JWs and get saved. You can't be saved by going through Catholicism and being confirmed. That doesn't save you. The common salvation was the salvation that was once delivered to the saints, and it hasn't changed. Now, hey, Joseph Smith said it changed. Muhammad said it changed. Uh, this Mary... Ellen Baker, she said it changed. And this apostle, this uh, writer of God said, no, it hadn't changed. It's the same salvation that you had delivered to you from the beginning. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried according to the scriptures and rose again according to the scriptures. And whosoever will, uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To ever received him, uh, he gives, believes in their heart, confesses their mouth, thou shalt be sh saved. So there's nothing changed. And uh, we're, we're living in a grace age. Uh, we're, we're admonished by these Pauline epistles on how to operate in our everyday life. And we're given instruction about those who are not included at, in this age, the Jewish people. But in the future... God's going to renew his work in reaching these folks with the gospel of grace. Now, they can be saved today, but primarily, right now, we Gentiles are enjoying a favor that nobody else is getting. We thank God for that. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a delivered faith. Um, I uh, 
marked in my Bible the faith uh, that he's talking about. And, and, it, and really, it's the first verse, and you don't need to turn there. I'll read it to you. You'll, be, you'll recognize it. It says this in Hebrews 1, 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in the times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Yep, that's what we know. We got a whole Old Testament full of it. When the apostle was writing this book, these Jewish, these Hebrews, it was written to Hebrews, we certainly glean from it, we apply it, we learn from it, but it was written to Hebrews. And they were told, hey, they knew about Elijah and Moses and Joshua and Jeremiah and David and Nahum. And about, they knew all these. Hey, any Hebrew in that day in around A.D. 35 to 40 to 45. They all knew about the Old Testament prophets. Do you know, most of them, even though they not, may not practice Judaism, most Jews know about these books. Even your secular Jews know about these books. In fact, they name their children to this day, especially in Israel, the most famous names are still the prophets of the Old Testament. I like to read these different Jerusalem uh, uh, online news agencies. There's about five of them. And uh, uh, it's, it's when you get into where these rabbis, and some of them, they, they really put these rabbis up front. I mean, they, everything that happens over there is under the interpretation of some rabbi. Uh, this past week, uh, one of the oldest rabbis in Israel, he was 95, he passed away. And they said he was an ultra Orthodox rabbi, which means he was an Old Testament Pharisee, is what it was. And, uh, and, and they talked about all that he did. Well, as he's named, you see the Bible names in his name. And then all the people that are talking about him, they're Bible names. I mean, they're, they're still saying Habakkuk. I mean, I wouldn't name one of our American kids Habakkuk. Habakkuk Jones. But we, you know, we use Jeremiah. We use Joshua. We use Bible names, but they are absolutely predominantly Bible names. So he said, God spoke to the prophets, he told these folks. But he said, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. The Lord Jesus. He is the express image of of the Father. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. God is a spirit. All that you'll ever see of God on this side of heaven will be the image, his son, the Lord Jesus. The express image, the revelation, the visualization. And so when Paul was or Jude was talking to these people here. He said, listen, it's our responsibility to contend. Right there in verse number 3, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. It was delivered. It was brought to us. And so the contending is, is actually working with agony to defend it. You know what Christians do today? They go in a shell when somebody challenges their faith and they say, I don't want to get in an argument. Well, God didn't call us to argue, but he did call us to stand up. Tell folks why you live like you live. Tell folks why you commit to uh, uh, services. Tell folks why you carry your Bible or you read your Bible. Now, I tell you, I've heard these street preachers being criticized. I, the, the more wicked America gets, I'm glad to see them out there. They really, if you say, well, nobody's listening to them. Well, they're standing out there with a Bible in their hand. <laughs> hey, uh, would you rather do that or see that bunch downtown protesting everything, you know? Uh, there was a bunch down there uh, right after Roe v. Wade was struck down. They had all the misfits in Escambia County gathered up down there. All the purple and green and orange and blue hair, uh, rainbow-colored hair, uh, p faces painted out. It's like, what in the world's going on? 
And, uh, and, and they're down there screaming at the little family, one little family across the street with signs they were holding, save the unborn. <laughs> and there was 75 people just about from here to that, that first pillar right there just screaming bloody murder and cussing that little family. There was two kids and mom and daddy. And I thought, hey, one thing about it, they're contending, this little family is. They're literally saying, this is where we stand. We're not going to fight with you, but we're going to at least stand up and admit what we believe. And that's what we're to do with the faith. And notice it's not a faith. He's not saying contend for a faith because everybody's got a faith. You know, I hear people say, I got faith. Uh, my faith sees me through. Well, is it the faith? <laughs> there's only one faith. The Apostle Paul said there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's not multiple uh, arenas that you can go in and claim it's the faith. It's got to be the one that was delivered to the saints. So the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ ought to give us total confidence because it was the only one delivered. Like I say, the Mormons don't have the faith once delivered. They have another faith. The JWs have another faith. And sadly, many mainline denominations tonight have another faith. It's not the faith once delivered to the saints. So he said, you need to fight, contend for it, because it's a definite faith. There's no doubt about it. And then uh, it's a definitive. He said, don't add to it. He said it was once delivered unto the saints. And then verse number four tells us and begins for the next few verses. It literally uh, lays out the deception and the lifestyle of those who have crept in. He said, for there are certain men crept in unawares. Now, to do that, you have to be stealthy. Now, that's a key word there, unawares. Because it meant they were able to slip in unnoticed. In fact, that word unawares has been used in a variety of ways in that ancient world. And one of them was when a criminal who was about to be sentenced uh, to death, he would escape and sneak out of town. The other day over here in Baldwin County, uh, a man was in his driveway. He had just come uh, from Illinois down there to visit his family. He had only been there two days. And somehow, somebody walked up to his car while he was in the driveway of one of his relatives in the middle of the day and shot him dead. The neighbor saw this, this figure running it had, the figure had certain clothes on and a hoodie and all that. And they saw him running and the police came. And they thought they had the guy uh, hemmed in. But somehow, and who knows how, he got away. He was able to creep unaware out of the neighborhood. And they had all the dogs and all the cars surrounding the two or three blocks there. And they couldn't find him. He stealthily got out. And so when we have this described here tonight, he's saying, hey, these people have come into what we know as the born-again, called-out assembly of God, the believers. And they've infiltrated in a matter, not saying I'm a false teacher, quite the contrary. They've come in and pretended in a cameo way to blend in. And they did it very well and found themselves later on in perfect position to defile and disrupt those churches. Now, that's why today, uh, you know, there's a movement. Uh, thank God some of the Methodist churches have pulled out of the United Methodists because certain people have come into that church and said it was okay to ordain those who live immorally and contrary to the word of God. And so I was shocked to see there's still some United Methodist churches out there that said, uh-uh, that's, that's not the faith we know came out of the Bible. That's not the systematic teaching of the New Testament. And so they, a large percentage, especially in Georgia, and it's even happening in Florida, they've pulled out of that denomination said, we'll not participate in that. 
It took years for these folks to begin to blend in and preach these doctrines. And what used to be a diehard Bible group of people suddenly find themselves pastored by those that they would not even begin to condone their immoral behavior 50 years ago. But now they're voting them in and, and using it as a badge of honor as though somehow we've arrived. Well, these men were just like that. In fact, he said there, they crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, grant you, they didn't come in to begin with saying we don't believe in Jesus. Quite the contrary. They did come in pretending to believe in Jesus. They would say they believe in Jesus. They would say we believe what you believe. But as time went along, they literally opened up to be who they truly were from the beginning. In fact, it was a satanic plot going on that enabled this movement to happen. Now this was going on back in 80, 60, and 70. So why do we think somehow that we've gotten so good in the year 2000 that we shouldn't be concerned about this? I'd say we're more susceptible in today's technological world and ability to have instant travel around the world. We're more susceptible to false teachers entering into Christian churches, Bible churches, and disrupting with deception. And the whole idea is that if God's grace is sufficient, then we don't need to pay attention on how we live. And that's the way they do it. They literally say, God's grace is great enough to cover sin so we can sin when we want to. That is not what the grace of God teaches. In fact, Paul wrote to, uh, to, uh, Titus and said, the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and it teaches us that we should live soberly righteously in this present world so grace is real you're saved totally by grace you're kept by grace even a Christian who's disobedient the grace of God preserves him but it never gives license to live like the devil. Quite the contrary. You say, that doesn't, that doesn't seem to complement uh, the grace of God. Well, bottom line is, His grace is sufficient. No matter. But, when teachers start teaching you because of that grace, you can live like the devil. Mark it, they're false. Now, they won't say live like the devil. Here's what they say. It doesn't matter how you do. I remember when uh, growing up, you know, we were taught that the Christian life, you had certain things you didn't do, you know, in the Christian life. And most of it was biblically right. Some of it got out of hand. <laughs> Some of that stuff was made up, but most of it was biblically right. You should separate yourself. You should uh, come apart from the world. You should not follow the fashion of the world or the way of the world. Certainly shouldn't take on the immoral lifestyle of the world. That was an absolute no. You knew what the Bible said about these immoral activities. He said, and such were some of you, but you've been washed. So we knew there was a lifestyle change. Now they don't teach that. The teaching in the churches, and I say predominantly nationwide, is listen, if you believe in grace, you just go out here and hit these clubs. You're all right. If you believe in grace, don't, don't pay attention to the uh, premarital uh, sexual uh, taboo that the Bible puts on any, any sex outside of marriage. Don't pay attention to that. That's old stuff, they say. And, and I've seen Christians who sat around Bible studying on videos and they all, a bunch of Christian so-called theologians who have absolutely very little knowledge, but they think they got a hold of grace and so uh, they get them a big cigar and they sat around and smoke it, talking about grace, puffing on it, blowing it in each other's face. And they do it as 
a way to say, God's grace has allowed me to do this. I'm thinking, what happened? How did we get from living separated to where we are today nationwide? And now, uh, of course, nobody, come, nobody meets on Sunday night. Around the, you say, no, oh, there's a couple. Yeah, there are a couple. There are a couple churches. There's, there's a church here and there. But I'm telling you, if you drove around here tonight, you left this building right now, and you drove and you passed 30 churches, you might find a couple out of the 30 that are having a service. Wasn't like that 30 years ago. What happened? Well, people are tired today. People were tired back then. I, I tell you, there's been, a, there's been an evidence that there's been some teaching that makes folks feel comfortable not being separate unto God. There's just something out there right now. And folks look for places like that. And um, I tell you, it's all tied up with this thing that we've got right here. Well, look what it says, and we'll get ready to close. He said uh, in verse number 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. So you're always going to have a cry. Remember when they left Egypt? And it says that the Israelites went away and there was a mixed multitude following them. There was unbelievers that left out with the people of God and infiltrated that crowd. And they're the ones that led them into that false belief and that worship of that uh, golden a cow. It was that crowd out of Egypt who'd been doing that for years who decided, let's tag along with the people of God. We'll fix them. And it took them a while, and they did. Uh, we don't have time to go any further tonight, but uh, one of the things that they, they uh, um, the Bible te- in verses ni- uh, 4 through 19, you ought to go read that in verse 5 through 19. There's incredible description of how they do this. They, they speak really good. They have people looking at them and saying how great, wonderful they are. Oh, aren't they wonderful? I had a guy one time give me a, sent me a video of uh, the church out in Houston, Texas. And, uh, and on, <laughs> on that video, the big uh, church where the pastor smiles and his teeth shine, ding. Uh, they sent me a, uh, on that video they wrote, this is a wonderful, wonderful preacher. <laughs> and I thought, I have a, a list of 10 or 15 things that that preacher has said that absolutely, absolutely contradicts what the Word of God says about salvation. I've seen that preacher on national TV saying that you don't have to know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you can reach God other ways. I heard that with my own ear on Larry King years ago. That preacher stood up. And then when they questioned him about immoral living, he would not say what he believed about immoral living. Now, these are described in this chapter right here. You'll see it. It's not any way to deny it. So contend for the faith. Things happen. Harvard at one time in 1693 was built to train preachers. In fact, on the gates of Harvard, if you ever get up there, walk through, the brick columns are still there that were laid in 1693. It says, to educate the uneducated preacher. It's amazing. They don't have any preachers being educated up there anymore. Just pagans. Liberal Christ deniers. So things happen. People creep in. Let's bow our heads together if you would. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. And we know that, uh, Lord, as the believers in Christ and Bible uh, believers, that maybe we don't have the numbers anymore. But we know God can take a remnant. God can take a 300 out of 32,000. And God, you can do your work. And so we want to be available to be those who will contend for the faith. And we'll give God the glory. Help us, enable us, and lead and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Don't forget to sign up, if you would, for the Wednesday night meal. Uh, they're going to be providing it. The menu's in the bulletin. And so please go by and do that. And God bless you. Look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night. Thank you so much.